Hello, my name is Eamon Doyle and I'm joined today by my colleague Jonathan Sloan. We are both from Esri Ireland and we're part of the team that supplies and supports ArcGIS here in Ireland. Many of you may be familiar with ArcGIS as a geographic information system with capability to create, store, visualize, analyze and share vector-based geographic information. However, you may be less familiar with the capabilities of ArcGIS with respect to acquiring, storing, streaming, interpreting and analyzing image data. Today we want to give a brief overview of some of the capabilities of ArcGIS by sharing with you some work we've been doing for clients using image-based machine learning and oriented image catalogs. As a result of our work over the past 10 years, ArcGIS is today a comprehensive system for imagery and remote sensing. It provides a wide-ranging set of capabilities for imagery management, visualization, exploitation and analysis. Today we are going to concentrate on just two of the capabilities of ArcGIS in this respect. It is generally accepted that imagery taken looking straight down at the ground, like traditional satellite imagery, can be visualized on top of a map and incorporated into your GIS. Other imagery, however, is more difficult to visualize and incorporate into a GIS. Such non-nadir or oriented imagery includes oblique, bubble, 360 degree, street side and inspection imagery, amongst others. Oriented imagery catalogs solve that problem providing a solution for managing, visualizing, exploring imagery that's taken from any angle. Over the past number of years, we have made rapid advances with the integration of deep learning into ArcGIS. This, when combined with the imaging capabilities of the system, allows for information and feature extraction from imagery, as well as object detection and semantic segmentation on both RGB as well as multispectral imagery. We have created and made available pre-trained models for common tasks like building footprint extraction and land cover classification. These capabilities can be applied to all forms of imagery, including drone captured, aerial and satellite sources. I'm going to hand over to John now to look at a few practical applications of these capabilities. Hello, my name is Jonathan Sloan and I'm a lead consultant with Esri Ireland and I'm going to give you an overview of two imagery based projects that we've carried out over the last 18 months. The first project that I'm going to discuss was carried out for a client, the Department for Infrastructure of Northern Ireland. The purpose of the project was to assess the utility of drone acquired imagery when assessing the risk to transport infrastructure from rockfalls and also as a second purpose to monitor seawalls. UAV missions were flown across five sites that ranged in size from approximately 100 metres long to our largest site at Benone, which was one mile long. High resolution imagery of seawalls and cliff faces were captured between November 2019 and 2020 and a range of 2D and 3D products were generated in drone to map and ArcGIS Pro. The findings produced from this project were the 2D products were of much greater utility when assessing risk, the ortho and 3D products were relegated to presentational aids and the oriented imagery catalogues proved particularly useful. This is one of the smaller sites that we were looking at. It's the Black Arch on the Antrim Coast Road. It illustrates the sort of information that we're trying to capture, where we have cliff face, which is prone to falls, and we also have coastal defences. The meshes and the ortho imageries generated from drone to map were good. However, the mesh lacked resolution and the ortho imagery obscured vertical faces. Oriented imagery catalogues allowed access to all the high resolution oblique and the imagery captured during the drone mission. With the OIC add-in installed in ArcGIS Pro, OICs can be added to scenes or maps and they allow you to click in an area of interest to see all relevant imagery that was captured for that area. The oriented imagery viewer has a number of different tools. The navigation tool will show the user all of the images that cover the same point of interest that they have indicated on their map or scene. The user can pan and zoom in on the imagery and they can also enhance the imagery by adjusting its brightness and its contrast. As you navigate and select different images in the oriented imagery viewer, You'll also see a field of view update in your map or scene, as indicated by the red polygon. This will dynamically 
show the area in your map or scene that is actually being covered by the imagery or the extent of the imagery that you're currently looking at. Whenever you have two or more oriented imagery catalogs, you can add them into the same map and scene. The oriented imagery viewer will acknowledge this by placing a drop-down box in the top left-hand corner of the screen. This will allow you to switch between the two different oriented imagery catalogs. So in this scenario, I'm looking at a 2020 picture, and then I change to a 2019. The oriented imagery viewer will try and select the best image for the overlap, but sometimes, as you can see in this example, it will select from a different angle. But you can quickly select another more relevant image, change to it, zoom through it, pan around, and then return back to your 2020 image. The second project that I'm going to discuss was carried out for our clients, the Ordnance Survey of Ireland. The purpose of the project was to assess the ability of pre-trained machine learning models to extract building footprints from aerial photography. The method required us to identify an area of interest. For the purpose of this project, we selected Drocata for our training area, and then we tested using Longford. The process required us to install deep learning frameworks for ArcGIS Pro, and to also download the USA Building Footprints model from the Living Atlas. We tested the model in a number of different scenarios. We baselined using the standard model. We then retrained using RGB and combinations of RGB and NIR and frozen and unfrozen models. We then reviewed the results to assess the results and to provide some sort of benchmark for how the models have performed. We identified the number of features that each model had returned. We then looked at those features and tried to classify them into true positives, false positives, and false negatives. Our best performing model identified 8,599 distinct features. In the same area, there were 5,885 Prime 2 building features. On analysis, we identified that our model was actually picking up a number of different tanks and structures that were not included in the building features data set. Analysis also identified that the model had failed to detect 720 buildings that were also in the Prime 2 data set. Of the features detected, 1,207 were identified as false positives. These could either be vegetation or artificial surfaces. And to try and separate out artificial surfaces from vegetation, we used an NDVI. Separating vegetation and artificial surfaces at this time was quite important. The vegetation features possibly could be building features that were maybe obscured by vegetation. But more importantly, artificial surfaces had the likelihood of being new features that hadn't actually been captured in the building features data set. This left us with 7,703 features that we assumed would be true positives and that we could compare to prime two building features. Our findings focused on two areas. The first was using the detected features as a source of change detection. And this gave us very positive results, even based on a simple area change value between the features detected and the original features. New features we discovered typically registered as false positives because there's no corresponding prime two feature. And we were able to use zonal stats in the NDVI to identify if these were natural or artificial and filter them that way. We would also like to build a classifier going forward to maybe try and enhance this classification of new build features. These images show the OSI Prime 2 features in bold black, and they also show the detected features in red. You can see in the images that there are some false positives, and these are largely still artificial surfaces, and we couldn't separate them out by using the NDVI. In addition to change detection, we were also looking at our model's capabilities with feature extraction. Ideally, we would like to pass ortho imagery into a process and extract perfect buildings at the other end. What we found was that this is quite likely in urban and rural areas where building shapes are regular and simple. But we found that in more complex areas like city centers, the regularized building footprints model process struggled to produce accurate building footprints. 25 centimeter resolution imagery is also probably not high enough for accurately capturing fine details such as bay windows. And initially, it looks like a resolution should be about five times five to 10 times smaller than the minimum feature size, i.e. if you wanted 50 centimeter accurate features, then you would probably need five to 10 centimeter images. The images that you're looking at show examples of the features that have been detected by the model. The image on the left 
shows the orthoimetry that was used for the process and the detected features overlaid on top of it. In this image, you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner, there's also two building foundations that have been identified as buildings. And this is primarily because they're artificial surfaces and they're also regularly shaped. On the right-hand side, you'll see the detected features overlaid on top of OSI Prime 2 data. And you can see the buildings and the bay windows have these images show how the model has performed in town centre type scenarios. As you can see, it hasn't performed very well. It still will pick up larger detached pieces of building uh, quite accurately. But whenever you come into terraced houses and finer detail that's behind the buildings, um, things start to go slightly wrong. This may be down to the fact that we haven't given it enough training data, or it may actually be a function of the resolution of the imagery that we're passing into it. It's something to look at at a later date. These images show how the model copes with larger buildings. And what you'll see are that small chunks of the buildings have been captured, but other parts have been missing, and that there are regular lines spread across it. And this effect is largely down to the patch size that we've chosen to use during the detection process. And it's also down to a lack of overlap between the patches, and we also have non-maximum suppression running, so any overlapping features will be uh, deleted in favour of the feature with the highest confidence. We think that if we look at these areas in more detail, we can actually get better results from this by either increasing the patch size or improving the stride in some way. These images show how the model copes with smaller industrial and commercial units. And again, you can see that it performs quite well, uh, primarily because the buildings are regularly shaped. Uh, you can see this especially whenever you overlap these features on top of the OSI Prime 2 data. And these images show how the models performed in typical rural areas. Um, what you can see are that there are still some false positives. Um, this is primarily because there's a lot of bare earth in this area. Um, also, what you can see is that silage bales have also maybe been picked up as a building. Thank you for your time. Both Eamon and I will be available for questions later on.